All right, I'm going to tell you, I'm a lawyer with 35 years of experience, and this book <laughs> is, is really hard to prepare for. And if you listen to Dr. Sproul or Dr. MacArthur preach through these books, they say exactly the same thing. And, and part of it is that it is so rich, it pulls in so many things that it's just almost overwhelming on how you approach it. So if you feel like that, we hear you and we feel you <laughs> because it does for us to a degree as well. But the Holy Spirit will illuminate for you what you need to know as we go through this. So we're starting Hebrews and last week we covered verses 1 through 4. Uh, what we're talking about basically in the first, well, the whole book of Hebrews is about the supremacy of Christ in um, every portion of the Old Testament and every portion of the New Testament. And as we talked about last week, the writer is writing to uh, Christians of Jewish origin who are struggling in some ways with letting go of the past and all the rules and all the trappings that they had in the Old Testament that were required under the Old Covenant and accepting fully that Christ, the Messiah, came and He fulfilled all these prophecies, there is a new covenant and that you don't have to go through all these things that they are being bombarded with. So uh, remember in verses 1 through 2 that the writer explains, and there's a lot just in verses 1 through 3, but in the first verse he explains that why... Uh, Christ is greater than the prophets. And then in verses 3, he talks about um, the glory of Christ and the radiance of Christ and that everything is upheld by the power of Christ's Word. And then in verse 4, which we talked just touched on briefly last week, he starts talking about uh, the angels. So let's start there. Uh, in a minute as we read the scripture, and then we'll go from 4 through 14. Um, but before I get into those things, what I wanted to do was talk about, as part of the su Christ's supremacy over the angels, why this was so important that the writer is addressing this right out of the gate. He spends two chapters talking about the supremacy of Christ over the angels. So why is that? And why does he use the Old Testament to Scripture to explain this? That God's Christ is God's Son, is the perfect high priest, he's the perfect sacrifice, he's the perfect king. So we talked about a little bit last week that one of the reasons that the writer takes this approach is because he's talking to Christians of Jewish origin. They know the Psalms. They have heard the Psalms. They know what we would consider many Old Testament books because they've heard them, they sing them, that's been preached to them. So those scriptures are prophetic. They are words throughout the scripture that give them the description of who Christ is and that Christ is coming and what he's doing, but it's not sinking into them as to that he's actually here and they can let go of those things in many ways. So <clears throat> we talked about, again, last week just a little bit, that the, the writer quotes very heavily from the Messianic Psalms, uh, which are, uh, you can look it up, but there's, there's lists, uh, Psalms 2, 8, 16, 22 through 24, 40 through 41, 45, 68 through 69, 72, 89, 102, 104, 110, and 118. So you'd think with all the Psalms, it'd be a little easier for them to accept this when it's finally there, but it's not. And so <clears throat> he spends his time, and in fact, when he talks about this in the scripture that we're about to read, uh, if some of you have a study Bible, we'll talk about there are seven quotes from the Old Testament that are used to, to establish the supremacy of Christ over the angels, uh, five of them 
6 if you use uh, one of the Psalms as support rather than Deuteronomy. But five of them are out of the Psalms. We'll go through those today. And then two of them are from other books. One of them is from 2 Samuel, which we covered in 2 Samuel, and we'll just do a quick reminder on that. And then the other is Deuteronomy. So <clears throat> the just like any good lawyer or teacher, he's going to use the writer. I'm going to keep saying he when I say a writer. I know there's some folks that think there may have been some uh, one or two uh, women that could have actually authored this. But in my brain, we just keep saying he because everybody that wrote in the New Testament are he. So if I say he, it's just a habit. So the writer, since we don't know who it is for sure, uh, is, is using those things that they know to convince them and to give them confidence that what they are being taught is true. So again, why is he having to do that? Um, <clears throat> because, as you'll recall, when we've talked about different uh, books, uh, you've got the Judaizers running around behind Paul saying, you must be circumcised, you must do this, you must do that before you can become Christians. And so I've said all this, these introductory things, and you may still wonder, well, then why are we talking about angels to start with? Well, because angels were very prominent in Jewish teaching under the Old Covenant. In fact, if you go back and you look, the angels were referenced over 108 times in the Old Testament and then 165 times in the New Testament. But it is interesting on the emphasis that was placed on it in the Jewish religion versus once Christianity started. And there's a shift in how things are viewed, uh, at least because of Jesus' teachings and because of the fulfillment of the prophecy. So if you also look at the fact that there are sects, Dr. Lawson mentioned this morning in his sermon, that you had Pharisees, you had Sadducees, you had the scribes. You've got all of these little groups. Well, there were more groups than that. There were other groups that um, actually, various sects within Judaism that actually more or less worshipped angels. They elevated them that much. They considered angels to be just one step under God, and they had problems, in fact, we're going to be talking about that next week. When Jesus says certain things, they immediately accuse him of what? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Okay, because this is something that they have, they are ingrained with and that they, they're not on the page because they expect the Messiah is going to establish an earthly kingdom. They don't, they're not even thinking about whether it's a spiritual kingdom or not. So in looking at this, uh, you, you take a look at what the angels are, and we'll do that in just a moment. Let's go ahead and read the scripture for this morning. Uh, we'll start at verse 4. Actually, I'm going to back up just a tad into the end of verse 3. Uh, when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name <clears throat> than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, he, God, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire? But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter of the scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, the Lord, in the beginning land and the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain and they will, all will become old like a garment and like a mantle. You will roll them up like a garment. They will also be changed, but you are the same and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, 
sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Um, I am going to be teaching next week, so if we get a little slow here on some parts, then we'll pick it up next week because it rolls right into chapter 2. So um, one of the things that we need to talk about here, again, he's calling them out on the supremacy of Christ over the angels. So what are angels? They're spirit beings created by God, which means they are also created by who? Jesus, as the Son. He was there at creation. Um, They're spirit beings who have no flesh and bones, but can appear in earthly form. We'll talk about that in a a little more in a minute. If you read the Old Testament, it also says they can appear in other forms, and they did. Appearing is... Lightning with clothing white as snow, brilliant, dazzling glory. In Matthew, and and again, we have the references to angels in the New Testament. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they just shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman. So what is one of the things that angels have done in the Old Testament and then continue to do in the New Testament? What is that angel there to do? Brian? Bring a message. They are created beings who are messengers. Uh, for God. They do other things for God. We'll talk about that in a minute. Angels are intelligent. They have emotions. If you look at Luke 15, 10, uh, 8, starting in verse 8, to give context, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. She do- Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. Verse 10, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So as you can see, there's, there's a, there is importance here of the angels and how they think about them. But again, it shifts when Christ comes. Angels don't marry and they can't procreate. I'm going through these things too because what I want you to know is if that you hear any religion, with air quotes, any religion or any cult that says Christ is not the Son of God, it is false. If they say Christ is the archangel Michael come to earth, that is false. If you hear them say God came down and physically had sexual relations with Mary to create Jesus, that is false. So that's just three. We can talk more about each one if you would like, but angels don't procreate. Dr. Lawson went through that when we were in Genesis talking about the Nephilim. Some argue that angels came down and had sex with people, and that's how the Nephilim were created. He did a good job of of explaining why that's wrong and what the real uh, portion of that scripture means. So let's look at Matthew 22, 28 through 30. 28, now, then at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? This is the Pharisees and the Sadducees trying to trick Jesus again and get him to say something that's going to get him in trouble with them from the religious side. Whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor will they be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Angels aren't subject to death. If you look in Revelations 12, 7 to 4, it starts, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and the angels were with the dragon. The dragon with his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. 
and the great dragon was thrown down, Lucifer, Satan, the serpent of old who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So the scripture shows us that one third of the angels as created beings were thrown out of heaven along with Lucifer. Angels are multitudes in the created creatures. If you look at Daniel 7, 9 through 10, it talks about, um, <clears throat> in 10, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, talking about angels, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. In Revelation 5:11. It says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? <clears throat> Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and the glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea under the earth is another uh, expression for what? Hell. Under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him, all of creation is saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And all the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped him. Angels were created before man. If you look at Colossians 1, 16 through 17, <clears throat> it says, backing up a little bit for uh, context in verse 13, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sin. What did we hear today in Luke 5? Christ exercised that authority without apology and in explanation a, a lot to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, which would include what? Angels. Both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have a first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So <clears throat> these are all things that should have been familiar to these Christians of Jewish origin. <clears throat> Again, they're still wrestling with the, there's this earthly kingdom that should be established. They've heard the message. They've accepted the message. They're trying to move forward. They're just getting confused. So he's, the writer is trying to properly correct this. They also believed and they taught that angels were highly organized and divided into ranks. I've already read you one script or scripture that says the archangel Michael does what? He, is, he conducts war. He leads the armies of heaven. That is his function. <clears throat> if God wants him to do something else, he will. But all, angels, the angels are all powerful. You've got cherubim, seraphims, whatever others you want, who guarded the God, Garden of Eden for angels with swords. So there's, there is this organization. In fact, um, <clears throat> if you get into it, you will see uh, as we go through just a little bit more that um, that, it, that view on angels in the Jewish tradition gets a little more extreme as you start getting out to some of the sex. But <clears throat> just as much as angels are powerful, we need help in dealing with spiritual battle because the fallen angel and his one-third fallen angels are out there to conduct spiritual warfare against us, which takes us back to um, Ephesians 6, which you know I like to quote a lot. 
but you, this is why you armor up. Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly, in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist the evil day and have done everything to stand firm. And it goes on from there. So <clears throat> then stepping down a little bit deeper into the Jewish views of the angels that the writer is trying to, to deal with here. Um, again, angels are important to the Old Covenant because they were God's messengers under the Old Covenant. And so <clears throat> there was this teaching within parts of the Jewish community that indicated that the angels not only were messengers or um, agents of God's wrath and destruction in certain instances, but they basically acted as God's counsel or senate. Now, again, we're talking about some beliefs that not all Jews held, but he's trying to deal with the entire waterfront here. Some of them got so far down into this that they actually believed that there were things called presence angels, that there were 200 angels specifically controlling the stars. There's a specific calendar angel. There's an angel that controls the sea. There's a recording angel who does nothing but take minutes of everything that happens everywhere every day. That's a really busy job. Uh, and then you've got others that some believe that there's basically an angel for everything, including every blade of grass that God has created. Now, when we typically think of New Testament scriptures, what is the primary purpose of the angels? We've talked about messengers, but to worship God. That's exactly right. To praise and worship God, because once Christ is born, after the proclamations there, and just but for a few other places in the New Testament that we'll talk about in a minute, angels are in the background after that. Why? Why does God need angels when His Son is born and delivered and is now on the face of this earth to carry out what the prophecies say and to create the new covenant? So, <clears throat> but it's still important for you all to understand this because angels were created to worship God and to serve God. And if that means they're created to serve God, they are created to serve who? Christ. So any religion, again, air quotes, that does not recognize the Trinity and Christ's supremacy and equality with God the Father and the Holy Spirit is what? False. They're a cult. They are a place not to be <laughs> going to church. Okay? They are off the mark on this. There are many out there that engage in this oneness um, explanation of theology that they want to say that, yeah, there is three, God, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but they're all three different people and they're, and, and they're not one and they, they just, they're not dealing with the Scripture. They're ignoring it. Uh, one, out, one cult, you know, specifically changes Scripture in its Bible, air quotes, um, to take the deity away from Christ. So if you have Jehovah Witnesses knock at your door, Hebrews is going to help you deal with them in a lot of, of what they want to say to you. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at verses 5 through 14. That is all important background. I've condensed a whole lot what's normally taught on that. You can dig into this more. I encourage you to dig into this more. So let's look at what you dig into. We, st we starting in verse 5. The first four is self-explanatory. What does it say? Having become as much better 
and I think Danny said superior last week, um, than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. So let's, let's see how he starts explaining that. To which angel did he ever say, you are my son and I have begotten you? So, and again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. So we're going to take these verses and we're going to kind of split them out into three things. The first set, four through seven, Christ is son, the angels are servants. Eight through nine, Christ is king, angels are his subjects. Verses 10 through 13, Christ is a creator and angels are just creatures. We've kind of talked through that a little bit to just give you an idea. But So you look at verse 5 and you immediately have to look back to verse 4. And what does verse 4 say? He's much better than angels and he inherited a more excellent name than they. What is that name? Lord. Lord. Messiah, King, Savior, Son of God. Um, Pastor Lawson said this morning, talked about Jesus' anointing, what those words mean, Christ. Um, so Christ is anointed. Christ is part of the Trinity. We know he was there at creation. There is, you know, there's no way we can fathom looking back. It's always good to be a, you know, looking in hindsight, but this is clear in what the Scripture says. Obviously, it's not clear to the people that he's writing to, otherwise he wouldn't have to be writing this. So, <clears throat> there is no Scripture that supports that you can, you've can you ever had an angel. So, let's look at some other stuff real quick. A couple ads that I don't have on your uh, sheets. The first one's Isaiah 4, 42.8 which says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. So let's just stop with that one. <clears throat> if Christ is God, God names Christ his son. Do you see what I'm talking about here? God does not share that uh, does not share his godness with anyone but himself. He's never said to an angel, well, uh, you can be God for a day. In fact, why did Lucifer rebel? He wanted to be God. Didn't work out well for him, did it? No. So, but again, we're talking about with human minds and the teaching that they've got and why they're looking at this. Then look at Job 38, 7. When the morning stars sang together... And all the sons of God shouted for joy. So let's just stop on that scripture for just a minute. Because people can get confused by this. There are scripture that say, in the small s, sons of God, referring to the angelic hosts. That is not the capital S, the son of God, that we're talking about there. Okay. Again, we're talking about the sons of God shouting for joy. The angelic host is shouting for joy. <clears throat> Angels are addressed as sons of God throughout some of the Old Testament Scripture, meaning that they are creations of our triune God. No individual angel. All the, we, we see individual angels called out in Scripture. Michael, we just read in Revelations. Who else do we know by name in Scripture? Gabriel. Gabriel. Okay. Why? Because in his messenger status, he was delivering messages and proclaiming some things. We'll get to that in just a minute. So if we look at where he goes in the Psalms for, chapter, for verse 5, you look at Psalm 2, 7. I will surely tell you of the decree of the Lord. And he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Remember back to our study of Samuel, 2 Samuel, and in 7.14, we have the prophecy delivered by Nathan to David. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come after you, and I will establish his kingdom 
He shall build a house for my name, the church, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. <clears throat> and I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of the men. What is he referring to there? The discipline before the crucifixion. <clears throat> the torture that was occurred. When he commits, let's see, commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever. Your throne shall establish forever. What is he telling him? He's establishing, the, this is the Davidic covenant where he's saying, your house will reign forever and it reigns forever through who? Christ. <clears throat> Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, prophecy. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace in the throne of David or over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Who is the Lord of hosts? God, Christ, not Michael, not Gabriel, not anybody other than those, the triune God. If you look on through the New Testament, you see the angels come in acknowledgement after Christ's baptism. Matthew 3, 13 through 17, most of us know that um, particular scripture where uh, he comes after the baptism and he says, um, I'll find it here. <clears throat> but Jesus answering him permitted this time for in this way it is fitting for to fulfill for us to fulfill all righteousness there's that word again then he permitted him after being baptized Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold the heavens opened and he saw the spirit of God descending as a dove and lightning on him and behold the voice out of the heaven said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Again, not an angel being called beloved son, Christ being called my beloved son. We also saw in the transfiguration, uh, we saw in John 17, we know from John 3, 16, almost all of us do by heart. If you don't, you need to learn it. Uh, it's on all those football signs. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, to whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So <clears throat> reading on in that one, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone does evil, hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought by God. So moving on to verse 6. He brings the firstborn into the world and he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. That is a reference back to Psalms 2, 11 and 12. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he may not become angry and that you perish in a way for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Then we look at what the, the, the angels, how they worshipped him in the New Testament. We had an angel that appeared, Gabriel, to Mary to tell her what? That God had chosen her to be the mother of Jesus. You go on and look at, and that's in Luke 1, 26 through 38. The angels also appeared to who around God's birth, Jesus' birth? 
the shepherds. Luke 2, 8 through 15. There, were, there was a messenger angel, and then what? An angelic chorus. The angels worshiping Christ. The announcement that Christ the Messiah was being born. <clears throat> angels then start not just being messengers, but they start ministering, and they minister to who? Christ. They minister him to Him after the temptation in the wilderness, Matthew 4, 11. They minister to Him as He's bearing the burden in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22 through 43. Now, while this isn't worship, this is acknowledgement on these next verses. We have heard in different contexts and in sermons and in school lessons that the demons know who he is. Now, I, if that doesn't convince them, I'm not sure. <laughs> now, of course, this hasn't all been written for them to do, but this is why the writer's telling him this. Matthew 8, 31, Mark 1, 34, Mark 5, 12, Luke 8, 26 through 28, Luke 10, 17, Acts 19, 13. The Demons know who he is. He's not an angel. He's God. God tells them, don't tell people who I am. What do they do? They shut up. When he, when he goes to throw the, the legion out, what does the legion ask for? To be thrown into the pigs rather than cast into wherever. So they recognize his supremacy Angels will continue to worship. Look at Revelations 5, 11 through 12. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. The number of them was myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things, I heard him say, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing, honor, and glory, and dominion forever and ever. And again, the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. This is based, this scripture on verse 6 is ultimately based on Psalms 97 7. Let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods. So, Again, he's trying to address that, you know, the thought that they've got these angels up above Christ. Verse 7, And I of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds, fires, and ministers of flame of fire? Remember in the Old Testament, this goes back to Psalms 104.4, He makes the winds his messengers and flaming fire his ministers. Stop and think about that for just a moment. Uh, you recall fire with, associated with angels? Anybody remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Two angels went and were stalking with Abraham, and they're looking down on the valley. Abraham pleads, you know, and so the two angels go down, and they end up with who? Lot. And what ends up happening at the end of that story? Fire, Okay. So it is clear in the Old Testament that God used angels in a way to deliver His divine justice. So <clears throat> He also uses fire to bear witness to other things. We see a burning bush talking to Moses. We see a pillar of uh, cloud by day and fire by night that led the Israelites through the <clears throat> wilderness. You see the fire that, D that Elijah deals with. And in his uh, story after uh, Bath no, not Bathsheba, Jezebel was going after him. So the son's throne is eternal and immutable. That's another point that he's trying to get through to them. So if you look at John 10, 24 through 30, um, he, the Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you were the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered to them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name. Now, if Christ was an angel 
claiming to be the Son of God, what do you think would have happened to that angel? He'd have been joining at least Lucifer and the rest of his group. Okay, So, <clears throat> the works I do, I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. The Father is not going to allow anyone to claim his name but himself in the person of Christ. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They will follow me and I will give eternal life to them. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. 30. I and the Father are one. This verse in, in 8 is going back to, um, <clears throat> but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter, righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Comes from Psalms 45, 6 through 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. In verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. An exact, uh, well, not exact, uh, but a pretty close to exact. There, there is some, the commentators will tell you, in this book of Hebrews, there's sometimes just a little bit of a change from what was in the Old Testament. There is some language that's used, and as it translates, it changes it just a bit, but it does not lose its substance or its meaning. Um, so, uh, in 9, then you look at Psalms 119.97. Uh, oh, how I love your law. It is, it is my meditation all day. And then we go on to verse um, 10. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they all will become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll up. You will roll them up like a garment. They will also be changed, but you are the same. <clears throat> and your ears will not come to an end. This is based on Psalm 102, 25 through 28. Of you, old, you founded the earth, and the heavens are your work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. So you see here, there's just a little bit of difference in how it's done between the psalm and what he's writing in Hebrews. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. The children of your servants will continue and the descendants will be established before you. This is something that they, they really struggled with. God is immutable. They kind of took that, but then they wanted to put this but on the end of it when talking about Christ or trying to understand that, um, that concept that he's here, he's fulfilling this law, and, and what is this? So, <clears throat> so, you need to remember that. God is immutable. That means God does not change. If you think God has changed, you need to look in a mirror because it's you that has changed, not God. It's that simple. In spite of what you want to hear from some of what I'll call r religious light theologians, again, air quotes, and our culture, which wants to give away little parts of God's sovereignty, God's power, what God means, and what and at the end of the day, the message of the cross, and at the end of the day, they come up with something that's not God. We don't get to do like the Jewish people did and add a bunch of extra laws to God's laws, and we don't have the authority or the right to pull anything away from the scripture. I don't care how culturally acceptable you're saying it is. I don't care how much you want to stress that, you know, the message of the cross is bloody. That's what I used to hear back in the late 70s, early 80s. I can't preach the message of the cross because it's too, it's too harsh. We need to be loving and invite people in. 
You do not compromise the message of God. God is unchanging. The message stays the same. God never changes. He is not becoming. He's being. Period. <clears throat> so, looking at verse 13, I'm actually going to make it. Uh, <laughs> but to which the God, to which angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet? That's what Lucifer wanted. He didn't want God in that seat at all. He wanted to take it. But he probably would have settled for being the right hand man if he thought he could get away with it. That's not God's plan. And... <clears throat> And we know what the plan is at the end. So, but this, this verse 13 is based on Psalms 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power in holy array from the womb of dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Uh, the Lord is at your right hand, and he will shatter kings in the, de in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. What, is he, what are they talking about there? the return of Christ and him exercising his authority and his power just as it's stated in Revelations and in other uh, parts of the Scripture. And then verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So where do we get our salvation? From Christ. How did we get it? Through faith in Christ's atonement. Now, just sitting here and knowing what we know, and we get the benefit of the New Testament scriptures as well, but is there any angel that could fulfill that role? Can Michael do it? Can Gabriel do it? No. See, they've got this concept that these angels are all powerful beings. Now, they are more powerful than a normal mortal, but it's still got to be within the context of God's law and scripture and and how things have been prophesied. So if you look at Psalms 3, 8, it says, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people, Selah. <clears throat> there is nothing that an angel can do for us that's going to bring salvation. So to worship an angel or idolize an angel like some of them were doing, what he's trying to tell them is, that's not going to get you there. You've heard the good news you are, have accepted Christ. You need to take these things out of your head. You don't need these sacrifices anymore. Christ was the perfect sacrifice. You don't have to worry about whether you're walking more than 100 feet to wherever or there You're not doing blood sacrifices anymore. Doing blood sacrifices after Christ uh, is uh, crucified and resurrected, resurrected, what is the purpose of a blood sacrifice? There is no purpose. He's already perfectly atoned for that. <clears throat> the other psalm that's referenced here is Psalms 18.2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. So, man, I... I whipped through that. <laughs> There's one other verse that I want to read to you, and that's in Malachi. They're like, what? Malachi? Yep, Malachi. So, if I can remember where, <laughs> there it is. Um, Malachi 3. Uh, it, you should go back and read Malachi. Uh, there's a pure, uh, uh, chapter 3 at least. But at the end of chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. So what does that mean? One, God does not change. And the only reason that the nation of Israel and the Jewish people were not consumed 
is because, because the covenant with God served as their shield ultimately. Did they get invaded and taken captive? Yes, because God allowed that as punishment for their transgressions. But did he abandon them? No. He fulfilled the prophecies that he had given them by doing what? Sending Christ and allowing Christ to be born. So <clears throat> that's a lot. We'll, we'll talk some more about the supremacy over angels, but I needed to lay that out, and there's a lot of foundation in there. It's a lot of extra reading that you can do within just the scriptures. But one application question is, what does, what does it mean that he has, quote, become better than angels? Has he ever been on the same plane as angels? No. Has he ever been considered to be, some will say, lower than the angels? The incarnation, when he came to earth, he did not lose his deity, but as he came to earth as a man, some interpret that to say that he's went lower than the angels. Take that one step further. Is he lower than the angels when he goes to hell after his crucifixion for those three days and before he's resurrected? Some will argue that, that yes, that means that too. But at the end of the day, it's, it's one of those arguments that I always say, and you're kind of sharpening the point of your head for no reason. Um, at the end of the day, he's still what? God. So it doesn't matter. He purposely, God and Christ, purposely, he laid his full deity down to become part God and part man for us. Then he was sacrificed for us as the perfect, as Dr. Lawson said today, all of our sins were laid on him, all of us. Everybody in this room, everybody in the world, everybody that's been since he came. So <clears throat> that's what it took, and he did it. None of the angels, you've always heard that all Christ had to do was call, and the angels would have come and taken him off the cross. That wasn't the point. Although the point there is, he has the authority to do that, but he has the love for you and us enough that he did not do that. <clears throat> so the next thing is, although angels are powerful beings and can do wonderful works, what could they not do? They cannot atone for your sin. They cannot bring you salvation. You can write the book of Moroni all you want and make that part of your catechism, but it is not going to save you. <clears throat> to fail to believe that Christ is the Son lowers him to no better than an angel or lower and removes his power and his authority as part of the Trinity. And if they're preaching that at you, get out of that church. If someone's in that conversation with you, you're starting to learn ways that you can respond to that. That's what this next chapter is going to help with as well. The whole book of Hebrews is going to help you with that, with why Christ is, has the superior authority, how you deal with this. Remember, there's plenty of people out there in all kinds of false religions that, that accept Jesus as this wonderful teacher and a great person, but he is not, they don't view him as God. So <clears throat> if you've come from one of those then the, and you've been saved out of that, praise the Lord, but you need to continue to, to study and you need to continue to learn because we as humans tend to run back to what we know and we tend to pick up things that we shouldn't. You've got to resist those temptations. If you are Christ, you are Christ forever. Don't let anything take you away from that. Don't let the devil deceive you or use that against you in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Remember, Jesus is Lord. God is in control. He holds, Jesus holds, final and ultimate authority over this world and indeed this universe. And we must learn to submit to that authority in all aspects of our life. And then we can rejoice that ultimately, I think I typed cart, but that's not right. We can rejoice that ultimately no power will ever prevail against him. Once you're in Jesus' hand, Satan cannot magically come back and grab you. 
If you have doubts about where you're at on that, then you need to get with us. You need to go through partners. You need to re read the scriptures. God is big enough that he can understand doubts, but you do need to look at that to make sure that you have been saved if you have those kinds of thoughts. Okay, So just as the angels had the privilege and have the privilege of worshiping Jesus and God, the triune God, uh, we should worship him as well with unbridled love and devotion. Let me go ahead and close this with prayer. If you've got any questions, just jot them down. We'll get them next week. Father God, we thank you for this book of instruction. We thank you for clearly laying out for us in this book that Jesus Christ is um, part of the triune God. He is your son. He has authority to speak things into existence, and he has the authority to remove things from existence. Lord, it's sometimes hard for our human minds to wrap around these, these truths, but with the aid of the Holy Spirit, we can learn these things. We can learn to apply them. And if we have additional questions, we can always reach out to our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can talk about these things and then learn the right things to apply to our life. Lord, we ask that you be with us in the next service. We ask that you be with us in the next week. We ask that your Holy Spirit quicken to us those things here where we might need to spend some extra time in meditation or in looking at additional scripture. We ask all these things in your son's holy name. Amen.